One of the biggest issues in the Arab countries is water. And climate change reduces the availability of already overexploited water resources in the region. By 2050, we have calculated that the region will likely face a 10% reduction in runoff due to climate change. And we should not forget already today that the region is facing a 16% renewable water supply gap. This supply gap is likely to increase to around 50% by 2050. Manal is going to talk more, and Amal is also going to talk more about water, so I will not dwell on this. Both the urban and the rural populations are affected. 70% of the poorest people in the Arab world live in rural areas and are among the most affected by climate change because they're so dependent on natural resources. Calculations we have been producing show that agricultural output are likely to decrease by up to 40% by 2080 due to the high dependence on climate sensitive agriculture. And as Madam Fasili clearly stated, it stresses the local food production systems and calls for more imports. Given that climate change is likely to lead to global food prices rising and spikes, that will increase the food prices for all households. But the ones that are most will be most affected are the poor because they don't have the asset potentially to mitigate this. This calls for safety net throughout the region. 70% of the population in the Arab world lived along the roughly 40,000 kilometers coastline. And many live without basic services, in informal settlements, in slums and the like, and have little capacity to adapt to climate hazards. We have all seen on television, if we haven't experienced it ourselves, how much like just remove dwellings of poor people in the slums. And we know from our research that when a poor household, a poor dwelling is being removed from the slum, that is not only the house and the roof over the head of, head of the people. People also lose their livelihood because 50% of the income of the poor are produced in the household. So they lose their house, their asset, and their livelihood, at least for a, a good amount of time. So we need to take climate change vulnerability into consideration up front when we make decisions about infrastructure investments and decisions in the countries. We should not forget that women are stakeholders in adaptation and important agents of change in the Arab world and in the world as a whole. And the data suggests that men and women are impacted differently in the Arab countries. Women, for example, in Yemen are fetching water. And our research shows that some women now tr have travel times of seven hours a day to fetch the water. So they're calling in their daughters to help them, meaning that the daughters are being pulled out of school. So this intergenerational spiral that we like to, to, to see means that the next generation of girls might not spend as much time in school either. So it's really serious for the whole Yemeni economy. Data also shows that women often are among the most least able to adapt. Because as these numbers show, women are the ones that are most engaged in agriculture and are very little involved in the decision-making processes. Therefore, smart climate policies in the Arab countries needs to be an inclusive process where we bring in the youth, the men and the women to take part in the decision making and increasing crime, climate resilience both in the household, in the community, in the region, in the country and in the whole Arab world. This calls for action. And we came up yesterday with DIAL. DIAL stands for diversification, integration, adaptation and leadership. Diversification needs to take place starting at a household level, meaning that at households in the rural Syria that have been faced with a drought, if they have diversified by having different income activities, they are more likely to be able to go through this drought without too harsh implications. We need to integrate adaptation into all projects. We are saying that we don't 
need adaptation projects. We need integration in everything. And not a most important, probably, we need leadership. We need a holistic approach that calls for youth, men and women to be involved. And I think the Yemen experience for the PPCR with the, with the government taking a serious lead by a deputy prime minister, leading a group of more than 16 ministers have really shown the way forward for the Arab world. I'm going to stop now. I've already talked more than I should. I would like you to raise your attention to this little card I gave you and to this website. The findings I've been presenting here is really a snapshot of all these right? So please send us your comment. We have two months now to change things. Is there things that you think are inappropriate for your countries, things that we are missing out? Please provide us with text. Those of you that provide us text that we use, you become a contributing author to the report. So share this website, share the information with all the people that you know. And then real quickly, I'd like to thank the Italians, European Union, IFAD, League of Arab State, and my colleagues in the World Bank for allowing us to do this work. Yeah, I don't know if you feel the passion and the absolute commitment that we've heard from Dorte this afternoon. But the three words which seems to form the clarion call act now act together and act differently i wish we could unpack that to say because that action must be based on the knowledge which is being gathered through this report so please make sure that you do use that card and that you actually engage with the process and then to act together it's another one but also act differently so we're not going to do the same thing that we've been doing for the last two, three decades and hope for better results. Because that's the first sign of insanity. When you keep doing the same thing, hoping that it'll give you different results. So hopefully you're sharpening your mind uh, for, the, for the panel which we're gonna have uh, after this. Now, we're gonna bring two neighbors to you this afternoon um, who are gonna talk to us about the issue of water from where they are coming from. One will be the case of Lebanon in terms of water, and the other one the case of Jordan. And these will be presented to us by Dr. Manal Nader, Director of Institute of the Environment, University of Balaman in Lebanon. Now he holds a BSc in Fisheries and Wildlife Management from the University of Minnesota in the United States of America, an MSc degree in Aquaculture from the University of Stirling in Scotland, and a PhD in marine biology and aqu aquaculture from Hokkaido University in Japan. He has led uh, the establishment of the Institute of the Environment and uh, the Marine Resource and Coastal Zone Management Program at the University of Balaman, ba Balaman uh, uh, that he is currently actually directing. He's managing several ex externally funded projects on sustainable development, and his research concentrates mainly on coastal zone management and the conservation of coastal and marine resources in which he has several publications. Shall we welcome Dr. Nader, please. In Lebanon, we do have more than 2,000 springs with a flow of approximately 1,000 million cubic meters of water, and our total surface water outflow approximates 730 million cubic meters per year. Now, <clears throat> out of that, we have 21% that is actually lost to sea or discharged into the sea, 58% go through the Orontes River to the Syrian Arabic Republic and approximately 20% of the occupied territory through the Wazani complex. Now, in terms of surface water, we know that almost all surface water resources in Lebanon are attributed to ground karstic aquifers. And our major surface storage structures are not abundant. Basically, what we have today is two dams. One is the Araun Dam on the Litani River with a capacity of storage of 220 million cubic meters and the Shabruh artificial reservoir that was completed in 2007 with a capacity of approximately 8 million cubic meters. In terms of groundwater, which actually provides most of the water in Lebanon, groundwater recharge approximates about 3,200 million cubic meters, and out of that, 2,500 constitutes the base of the flow of rivers. Snow cover for us is the main source of groundwater recharge in addition to what we call precipitation or rainwater percolation. The quality of our groundwater aquifers is already very poor due to management mostly. Uh, we have problems with pollution, seawater intrusion, and one of our biggest challenges is to overcome the issue of overdrafting where we have 45,000 
private wells with approximately 70% of them being illegal, which means we cannot monitor the amount of water that's being drafted from those wells. In terms of snow cover, which is very important, our studies about the contribution to the water resources are very scarce. Uh, nevertheless, we know that it covers approximately 25% of the Lebanon mountain chain and a little bit of the anti-Lebanon mountain chain, about 1,200 meters. It contributes one-third of the average yearly precipitation, and our melting snow contributes approximately 50% of the discharge of coastal rivers, which mostly occurs in the spring. In terms of water balance, which is the most important component, uh, of course, there's absence of consistent information, but work is being done to increase the data. Approximately 50% of the average yearly precipitation is lost through evapotranspiration, while additional losses include surface water flow to neighboring countries, as we have stated before. Of this, uh, 2,600 uh, mil uh, million uh, cubic meters of surface and groundwater is potentially available. But what is exploitable from that approximates about 2,000 million cubic meters. We have a lot of pressures on the water sector in Lebanon. First and foremost, like all developing nations, we have a rapidly growing population. We have an expanding economy, basically when the political situation allows it. We have increased urbanization, unregulated in many cases, which puts a lot of pressure on the network itself. We have agricultural activities where the sector is one of the largest consumers of water resources. And we also have a lot of concentrated tourism activities in the summer where we don't have any rain during that period. All of those are leading to over-exploitation and to extreme pollution of our water resources that are exacerbated, of course, by the issue of climate change. Now, this is just a trend of business-as-usual scenario versus adaptive measures. You can see the blue line actually is our available supply for until 2080. And what you see the green line is that if we remain as we are and we don't adapt to the issue of water and we remain in a high demand scenario, by 2015 we will not be able to actually know what we can supply to our population. On the other hand, in the low demand scenario, and if we include adaptive measures or if we introduce them and there's political will to actually move forward, we will be able to meet our water needs as a nation by 2080. Now, like the, uh, the main problem that we, we have with the sector itself is its management. There is the inadequacy of the public authorities to meet the growing, growing water needs, the absence of effective regulation and enforcement. Just take an example, the 70% wells are, are unregulated. And a small calculation showed that, that the cost of health impacts of water pollution is approximately $7 million per year, while the cost of excess bottled water consumption approximates $7.5 million per year. And what the population has done is that it started relying on private uh, provision of water supply, and this, of course, has aggravated the depletion of the resources. Now, the major challenge is for the sector itself or for the government. Only half of the total volume is distributed by the authorities reach the consumers, and this is due to network losses. Consumers, therefore, like we have stated, they develop their own means of acquiring water, and this reduction of losses and leakages alone will not really cover the demand. Nevertheless, we have to start working on this. In addition, for the future, we need to mobilize new resources in order to meet the needs. Now, the government of Lebanon has been introducing some key reforms. Some have started, others have not. They have been preparing an integrated water sector strategy with a clear vision. They are preparing a national water master plan. What we need also is for parliament to approve the water code. Also, what we need is an introduction of a tariff structure that is based on costs and volumetric consumption that is not existent today in the country. We just pay a basic rate for consumption. We are also preparing a short and medium term investment plan. Now, this is the 10 year plan to meet the future water needs. It includes constructing dams and reservoirs, and the objective is to increase storage capacity to approximately 800 million cubic meters by 2018, extending drinking water projects and developing, rehabilitating, and maintaining the adduction networks, constructing wastewater treatment plants, basically to protect underground water resources from pollution, also reducing pollution of rivers, as well as reducing the losses to the network. So it's not a one issue, it has to be across the board. We're also suffering from low adaptive capacity. Basically, we have a limited capacity to store rainwater, and this is, we talked about it from, we only have two dams that do this. We are also have excessive reliance on groundwater resources and considerable losses in the distribution network. Another thing that we have to do is we have to restructure the agriculture sector that consumes approximately 65% of what's available. 
Another thing that we suffer from is the lack of measures that promote water conservation. Very little awareness activities are taking place. Another thing is the political will to implement the 10-year water plan that's leading us to a lot of difficulties. In terms of adaptive measures, first and foremost, we need to start implementing the 10-year plan. We need to uh, establish the Lebanese Center for Water Conservation and Management, I think, is being established and it should start acting. This is very important for us in order to develop a database of water resources, in order to know what to plan for the future and have the scenarios being more realistic. We need to develop and promote sand water resource management, revise water pr pricing for domestic use, basically introduce volumetric prices, promote efficient irrigation, restrict well drilling permits, as well as maybe close many of the wells. In addition, we need to develop a very clear agricultural policy that redefines crop type based on water needs and availability and region. We have mountainous regions, so we have a lot of microhabitats that require different approaches for agriculture. We need to also promote water reuse at all levels, as well as recharge aquifers where feasible and possible, as well as introduce the idea of artificial aquifers for the storage of water. And in addition, and lastly, because I know time is limited, is to draft a penal code for polluting water bodies. So this is just a short snapshot of our sector. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's good to know that uh, Lebanon does contribute uh, water to your neighbors. And uh, we in Africa, of course, have had to learn how to share the water of the Nile. And I'm very glad to hear that there is this kind of spirit also now to talk to us about the issues in in the jordan and the matter of adaptation we will have uh, Ms. amal the babse who is the director of sustainable development uh, of the amman institute greater amman municipality of jordan she is the director of sustainable development in amman institute in jordan she has over 10 years of experience working in the area of environmental sustainability including overseeing a national project and coordinating the Water and Environment Program at a local research center and leading the Environment and Energy Unit of the UNDP Jordanian uh, Country Office. In addition to representing Jordan in over 20 international conferences, Mr. Babsa has published many articles and reports related to environmental protection and management. So can we welcome uh, Mr. Babsa, please? Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll move now from Lebanon, where they have a lot of water, to Jordan, where we consider as the uh, one of the four, uh, like, uh, poorest country uh, uh, in the world. Um, so, uh, before just starting, I would like to share two maps with you. The first one is about the uh, available water resources in our region, in the Arab state region, where we can see that almost the uh, the majority of Arab state is facing a problem in a way or another uh, in the amount of water available. And the second one is about that is related to climate change where the IPCC uh, fourth report stated that our region is considered as number one affected by climate change at a global level. Of course, in a different shape. We have some dry area, we have wet area, we have flash flooded in some places where we have a drought in other places. And let me now zoom in more to Jordan and to share with you some facts about the water situation in Jordan that we are facing today. In principle, we're having uh, limited uh, resources, uh, not like Lebanon. We have the majority of our water resources coming from groundwater, surface water. We're using the non-conventional uh, water resources like the treated uh, wastewater, in addition to uh, a small portion of the uh, desalination. Uh, in general, we would need like every year around uh, 1,500 million cubic meter uh, for our uses. If we compare that to water demand in Jordan, and we use it for uh, municipal use, uh, for industry, for agriculture, we will see that we will need uh, around 1,500 uh, million cubic meter per year. That put us um, on a challenge, on the different challenges that relate to this issue, in addition to other challenges that we are facing, uh, similar almost to what uh, Lebanon uh, is facing nowadays, like the number of population and the increased rate of population, like the uh, high demand on water uses, like the 
the uh, over exploitation of our limited water resources. We have problem with our also financial resources and how we can use this to implement major project in order to uh, provide Jordan with more uh, water resources. And finally, we have three of our main water resources are shared. One as a, a groundwater uh, and two are a fresh water system. So the consequences after having all of these facts about water situation in Jordan, that we have the demand is higher than the available water resources. We have 900 while we need 1,500. So we have a water deficit in the normal situation, as you can see in this, in this chart. We have more population and we have a population growth. Nowadays, we're having 6.1 million. After 10 years from now, we'll be around uh, 8 million. So that also put more pressure on our water resources. And unfortunately, that will decrease the share per capita. So we're not getting the amount of water that we used to get last year. And people next year will also get less and less amount of water. If we have all of this information just about the water situation in Jordan and now we implement or we think about what are the impacts of the climate change uh, on this specific and sensitive sector in Jordan, we will see that although Jordan is not a contributor to climate change like any other developing countries or countries from the region, but yet still we are producing greenhouse gases and we're contributing. The baseline scenario shows that the um, uh, minimum and maximum average temperatures will be increasing. The precipitation will be unfortunately decreasing, so the amount of rainfall that we use to receive is getting lower and lower, and I'm just showing one of the uh, graphics that shows the trend in one of our stations in the northern part of Jordan, where you can see the mean uh, um, amount of water is just decreasing. Based on that, we can see the vulnerability of the sector to climate change and in the different, different scenarios run by the uh, United Nations, different studies in the country, as well as studies that uh, university professors have done in Jordan, we uh, would uh, expect that we, the amount of surface water will be decreased between 20 to 40 percentage, and that will have its great impact on our uh, surface water, groundwater. So if we have like 10 percent decrease in the rainfall, that means that around a 30 percent decrease in the groundwater recharge will be affected and this is the diagram that I just showed before when I talked about the water deficit. If we have the climate change and we take the best scenario that we have 15% decrease of the amount of uh, rainfall, then the, this deficit would increase to be like this size with the best scenario um, uh, of the uh, coming few years. Based on that, uh, that we're expecting this pressure on the water resources, which means that high temperature, uh, our higher temperature, this amount of precipitation, more stresses on water resources, more stress on the agriculture and the agricultural need would increase. And then we have uh, more problem on food security as this kind of circle where, as Dorothy mentioned, water is not a, a standalone issue, it's a development issue and linked each one to different uh, aspects. So we have, in order to prepare ourselves for climate change adaptation in water sector, we have studied what are the different challenges that I think we're sharing it with the majority of uh, countries and from the region as well as from Arab state. And um, in our second national communication, we came up with the different uh, kind of adaptation measures. But before going to these uh, measures, uh, just in brief, uh, the most important thing is that we're trying to make the linkages between the climate change and disasters reduction between the long-term planning to the short to the short and long-term planning we're trying to, uh, to find the appropriate and the right institutional arrangement as as we said the climate change is a development issue rather than an environmental issue where we should link it to the economic development social development as well as to the environmental dimension and finally we should find the a proper uh, regulation framework that will help us all to act together at the national level um, at the same time at the local level and to find the suitable financial mechanism to help us going uh, to that dimension. 
So I'm just going now to summarize in one minute the most uh, appropriate or the most important uh, adaptation measures that we came up with. We uh, divided them uh, in relation to water into three different categories. One about uh, the residential use of water supply, and here we were focusing mainly on, like Lebanon, reducing the amount of water losses. It used to be like 52%. It decreased to be like 46, but still this is a huge amount, almost half amount of water we're losing. We're trying to uh, introduce water harvesting at different scale at the municipality level, using it in different, for example, regional parks and gardens, using it at the uh, roof, house roof. So this is something that we're encouraging in addition to, you, to use and introduce the new technology and have a kind of technology transfer on the best use and efficiency of water uh, resources. In relation to agriculture irrigation, which is the most important aspect, as I showed before, almost uh, 60 to 70 percent of our water resources are being used for irrigation. So what we're trying to do is to look for the better options for efficient uh, irrigation techniques, uh, plus introducing a new a drought resilient uh, plant or plant uh, that are uh, drought resilient, in addition to look for more efficient uh, way for groundwater use. And finally, we have to, uh, to rely on the non-conventional uh, resources of water, like treated wastewater, and to use them, to use the effluent in a very good way. And nowadays, the majority of agriculture irrigation in the Jordan Valley are being irrigated from King Talal Dam, where the water is coming from Irmuk River, part of it, and the rest are coming from uh, Khribet Samra, which is uh, the, the biggest uh, wastewater treatment plant in the country. I'll stop here and go back again to you, sir, for the rest. Well, thank you very much. I do not know if you feel half as much as I feel uh, in terms of what has really been a whirlwind. And um, I hope that um, most of you here are professionals, very well educated people, so you don't need too many words to understand what is being said. But really, we do want to thank you very much. In case you didn't know, each, pan, each speaker was given seven minutes. And um, we're just slightly over five minutes behind time, which is phenomenal, for, at least for us in South Africa, wouldn't you say? Man, I think it's brilliant that we've done this. The idea behind the next session is to really try and put this whole information into perspective. I'm thankful that a lot of the information that you have heard will be made available, I'm sure, but also it will be part of the text that will be going out as part of the, the report that was alluded to much, much earlier. Because it, it, it dawned on me that, you know, we could be caught up in statistics and actually forget that we're talking about people. The impact on individuals, impact on the young girls whose mothers have had to, to draw them out of school so that they could cut down on the seven hours a day of travel to actually get water. And so the idea behind the next session here is to stimulate us further, to focus our minds a little bit more, to challenge us in terms of how we can engage and participate, and uh, of course to hopefully mobilize you to action as you go back to your various places around the Arab world. So I will not really take a long time to introduce the panelists, except to say that we have, first of all, from the World Bank, uh, in terms of sustainable development, we have Mrs. Rachel Kite, who's been on this job for two months, and she already has all the answers that the Arab world needs as far as the World Bank is concerned. And she's going to give us that wisdom uh, this afternoon. But she has worked both in agriculture and environmental issues, and infrastructure and urban development issues, both as it is now within the World Bank, but also within the uh, International Finance Corporation. Dr. Dagger was uh, an economist uh, from the uh, Colorado School of Mines, who's an assistant professor at the economics department of the American University of Beirut. Uh, she will also be addressing us uh, very briefly uh, this morning, I mean this afternoon rather, I'm sorry. I've been trying to learn some Arabic to say, how do you say afternoon? And I gave up at about noon to we'll try and do that. Then we'll have engineer Zawa al Kuari, who's the Director of Environmental Assessment and Planning, Public Commission for the Protection of Marine Resources, Environment and Wildlife Kingdom of Bahrain. And uh, she is preparing a second communication report 
for the UNFCCC. Mrs. Alcuera has a diverse experience in different environmental issues and is participated in a lot of uh, activities as well as think tanks around, around this area here. So there you are. Now we will, first of all, hopefully get a response to one or two questions. So here we go. Um, I'd like to start with you, if I may, Mrs. Kite. Um, what, 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 what is it about the World Bank that causes you to be concerned about climate change? And how does the current study that you are actually encouraging going to enable you to carry out your mandate as the World Bank? Maybe if we can take a couple of seconds, uh, make it maybe make 10 seconds, and respond to those questions as a way of getting our minds focused. If you think about the World Bank group, um, it, it, it is a group. We, um, you know, we, we, lend, uh, we lend finances to governments on different terms, you know, for poor countries, for, for middle-income countries. We invest in the private sector. Um, we um, have political risk insurance as well. So we have a whole suite of financial tools available to us. We also provide advice. We provide advice to government, but we also provide advice to uh, the private sector on how to be competitive, so how to turn the challenges of climate change into opportunities for investment. And we work in partnerships uh, in order to bring the knowledge from our activities with our client countries and activities with, with the private sector clients into the global domain. This report is really important because it is driven by the region and driven by the researchers of the region. And our job is to bring our global knowledge to the mix um, and then really to help um, the regional perspective be brought up back into the global debate. Um, I think that this is very important because I think it will dispel myths, myths outside the region about what the region is, that it's just um, some kind of uniform desert. In fact, the uh, complexity of the challenges are different for each of the countries as we've mm. just begun to hear and the solutions are going to be different, but also the solutions are going to be homegrown. And I think the international community, whether it be from a financial perspective, from a technical perspective, or from an advisory perspective, needs to be able to tailor its solutions to the demand from the region. And so I'm very glad to be here with the League of Arab States because I think their leadership helps us bring money, bring advice, and bring technical assistance to the region in a way that's appropriate. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like us maybe to move a bit to the economic aspect of these things, if I may, with you, uh, Dr. Leila Dagger. Um, uh, for, for yourselves, what actually do you think is going to be the kind of impact on households' welfare as a result of this climate change that we're so uh, focused on this thing? Yeah, uh, thank you, Caesar. Um, um, so, uh, first, um, of course, we have heard all the other presenters, and we know that climate change will affect all of the Arab uh, countries with no exception. Um, but what is more important is that it will affect the Arab countries in an unequal way um, that is regionally and socially unequal. And what I mean here is that it will affect um, the least developed countries and uh, poor regions in, in each country more than other regions. And that is because, of course, they are more, more vulnerable and they are, they are highly dependent on the natural uh, resources and they have a limited capacity to adapt to climate change compared to the others. And um, here I'm talking about almost one third of the Arab population, that is around 100 million people in the Arab countries. Um, something important to note is the wide divergence. I don't know if uh, some of you might not be familiar with the, all of the Arab countries, but um, there's a huge divergence. If you look at, for example, um, the GDP per capita, the, the, the range is from $1,000 per capita to more than $50,000 per capita. So this is something um, one has to take into consideration. Another important point is that um, the impacts will be larger and, and the, as time passes. So long run impacts um, of climate change are, um, are of course uh, more significant than short term impacts. Um, now, I guess uh, Dorothy has already given um, the example of Syria and the droughts and how it impacts the GDP. There's, um, I'll give another example about uh, Yemen. We all know that it has flooding problems. 
um, um, those, those, uh, the flooding um, hits the agriculture sector uh, more than, for example, the industry and the tourism sector because those are more resilient in terms of number. Uh, numbers um, in, uh, between the period 2008-2012, um, the real income loss of, of those floods has been 180 percent of the pre-flood agricultural value added. So it's 180 percent between 2008 and 2012 of the value added from agriculture. So this is a huge number. Um, also, the direct effect of flooding has been a spike of 15 percent uh, of hungry people around the, you know, in and around the flooding areas. Um, thank, you. Well, thank, thank you very much. We will certainly be picking up quite a bit on some of the things that you have raised for us. And uh, last night I learned a lot indeed in terms of the, the, the difficulties and why is it that there are so many women in the Arab world who are responding to the clarion call for the participation in the report as opposed to, to, to men. But I think we would like to just get a perspective from you, if you, if you will, uh, Mrs. al -Kuari, in terms of some of the specific impacts of climate change that you are seeing currently in Bahrain. Thank you. I think the, the main issue, as the, everybody from my colleague uh, mentioning, is the sea level rise is the main issue we are having in the country. When we model the, the issue and the, the problem, mm -hmm. we find that it will be affect the, the erosion of the sea level, it will affect the groundwater, which is the main source for us in Bahrain, for the water, for, for the water problem. And uh, that's why we are trying to uh, identify the issue, identify the problem, uh, put the, the, because I think in, the, in our region we know our problem and we are trying to get uh, solutions of these problems. We, we, are, we are in a stage that we are identifying our problem, we know what is it, we know how it will affect us mm. and now we are working on how we can get a solution and support yes. to in order to Great. give a solution. Great. I'd it. like to ask you a question about the sense of immediacy in Bahrain. Is there a sense in which people realize mm. that this degradation or even lack of ability to recharge, uh, mm. that it has got a direct relationship between what they do mm. and what happens? Yeah, I think the, the people are uh, knowing about the, the issue and they uh, they appreciate the work done in this field. Okay. And they, everybody is uh, in, in, in a way to, to put a plan to solve this problem. Yes. And this is the... This is the okay. Let's move to things political, if I may, with you, Madam, uh, Madam Fatima El Mala. Obviously, uh, from the, uh, the, the Arab League, the, 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 the political will, to actually do something drastic and do it now and do it together. How can you quantify it for us? Can we rest assured that we will we can depend on the leadership now at a political level, at ministry level, that we will see progress? And, and secondly, if I may quickly, in terms of this report, is it in any way, shape, or form going to shape and inform the way in which the league actually acts? And how are you going to make it popular among them that it becomes a compelling document? I think uh, climate change is a uh, very important issue for the League of mm. Arab States, and it is on the political agenda. If you could get closer, please. I'm sorry. And it is on the political agenda of the Arab summits. Uh, 